call to order as the Carter County Commission is meeting regular session Monday, March the 16th, 2020, 6 p.m. Thank everyone for being here. And at this time, uh, Mr. Harrell is going to come up and do our egress plan, please. Thank you, sir. <laughs> On behalf of the uh, Emergency Management Office, we uh, welcome all of our visitors tonight to the commission meeting. Uh, a few safety related items that we always go over. In case we do have a, a fire alarm, uh, we are to exit out towards the monument. Everyone is to exit out this way to the back of the house. Everyone is to meet in the back parking lot because the fire department does not want anybody in the front because that's where all the trucks will be. And they will be parking there and they don't want anybody in the front. So in case we do have a fire alarm, everybody's still in the back of the courthouse. Uh, our bathrooms, which are handicapped accessible, are at the end of this hall on the left for the male and the female. And in case we have a uh, heart attack tonight or a, a medical condition, a heart medical condition, uh, we do have an AED on the first floor. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Thank you, Mr. I'll go ahead and announce that Ms. Culler will not be here tonight. She has an illness in her family that she's dealing with. Is my mic working now? Not working. Okay, I'll keep on going. I can't hear what I hear. I think so. You hear me okay? Everyone in the back hear me? Okay, Ms. Culler will not be here tonight. She has an illness in her family. And, uh, I see too that Ms. Holden is not here, but that kind of work will be called the roll, please.
to our government all the way down to our county officials. Lord, we pray that you have your will and way in their lives, Lord. God, we pray that we make the right decisions, Lord. We're not perfect. Sometimes we fail to make mistakes, God. We pray that you forgive us, strengthen us, God, in the areas that we fail in. Lord, tonight we pray that you have your will and way. We ask these things in thy name. Amen. Amen. Attention. Salute. Blake. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Time, I'd like to recognize all the elected officials, department heads. I see also some special uh, elected officials here as well. So if you would please stand, we would appreciate it very much. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Do you hear a motion to accept the minutes as presented? Motion to accept. accept. Commissioner Blair is here second. Second, Commissioner Frazier. Any uh, corrections or deletions, additions, or anything to the minutes? Uh, Commissioner Garland. I just want to make, uh, I think Miles Cook, I believe that the correct spelling is with a Y on his. It is. His, yeah. Just moved going forward with any record or anything we have. Just, okay, Miles Cook. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. And that's all 267 as far as the first one. So. Any other any other corrections? Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. <coughs> Thank you. Minutes passed. That correction. That microphone's doing real well, Doctor Acuff. Not screaming now. Thank you. Compliments of uh, Commissioner Campbell. Commissioner Campbell, thank you, sir. For a team, aren't we? Yeah. Madam Clerk, would you read the uh, notary? Final three. Campbell of these columns, Otto Mathers, Tammy Perkins, Tracy E. Walker, Debbie Cruz Vance, Ricky Daniel Hoffman, Deborah E. Sutherland, Amy D. Arrington, Kelly Shook. Betty W. Mustard, William J. Bird, Amy C. Stetson, Jacqueline A. Lewis, Angela C. Clark, Donna G. Williams, Kimberly K. Henniger, Caitlin A. Ashley, Christine Luster, Paul E. Yoder, and Anne Kimberly Sands, and the constable, constable Mom, Miles H. Cooper. Your motion to approve? Motion to approve. Commissioner uh, Hill, T. Hill. There's second. Second. Commissioner James. Madam uh, Clerk, please call the roll. Please reveal. Thank you. The motion passed. At this time, we'll have a 10, 15 minute presentation by Mr. Bruckman. And do I have anyone else from the health department? Ms. Ms. Hurt, thank you. Come on there. Anyone? All of us. We'll do a panel presentation. Yeah, I can introduce everybody. I want to have a little more face here for everybody. Good evening. Just want to introduce you briefly, and before Chad has to pull the mic up for his size, and I just wanted to let you know that with coronavirus, of course, we have no positive cases in Northeast region in any of our counties, with the exception of Sullivan County, and it does have one positive case. So I just wanted to open with that. Wanted to introduce you to Phyllis. She is our nurse supervisor at the Carter County Health Department. And I, I think it's important that you have left the places because we're right up around the corner and you might, I'm familiar enough of the face. Um, 
Chad Bruckman is our Regional Emergency Response Coordinator for the region, and he and Dr. David Kursky, I believe you remember hearing from him with the Health and Welfare Committee um, just a few, few days ago, it seems like, um, and, and of course things have changed a lot since then. Um, and they are very fluid and changing really hourly. So I'll let Chad um, cover some high points of where we are right now. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to do our best to answer them. Thank you, yeah, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, I would just encourage you that you do have good resources here in Carolina Bay, so reach out to them as you always have in the past uh, concerning this uh, novel coronavirus that we're dealing with right now. Uh, just to give you a little more, a little more update on, on cases, uh, as of this afternoon, there's been 52 cases identified in the state of Tennessee. And I'll just go by county real quick to give you an update. You can find this on our, on our TDH Health website. If you're interested, it's updated every day at 2 o'clock. And the case counts are also divided out by county, which is important. So we've had one case in Campbell County, 25 in Davidson, one in Hamilton, uh, one in Jefferson, one in Knox, one in Rutherford, one in Sevier, two in Shelby, one in Sullivan, and then 18 in Williamson County. Now, one of the things I'm going to say is we're not we're not experiencing a community spread of, of, of COVID-19 in the Northeast region, even though we've had a case in Sullivan County. I believe he'll be coming he'll be coming off uh, self quarantine uh, or self isolation here soon. Uh, that being said, there is widespread uh, COVID-19 <coughs> in place in Williamson County and Davidson County. Obviously, if you look, there, look at the numbers, that's the place there. Um, the age range right now that's being tested, uh, there's actually been, I'm trying to see how many we've tested. Uh, we've tested over um, 289 uh, tests have been completed so far in the state, and then the, the number of those tested by us, by the Tennessee Department of Health, is 19, and then the 33 have been tested by private labs that have been able to come online here in the past week or so, your lab core, your uh, Quest, your AEL, uh, labs like that. So what's currently happening is, as far as testing goes in our region, uh, if we have a provider that for some reason can't provide testing through a lab service, then we have, they're, they're calling our uh, information line at our regional health operations center, which has been stood up now since last week, and we have uh, we have uh, medical reserve corps volunteers and RNs and doctors in that in that call center right now, and we're taking calls from the community if they need testing and they don't have a provider, then we'll take care of that. However, if they do have a primary care provider, we're referring them back to that person, that that doctor uh, now because testing is more widespread and available in our in our in our state now with the private labs coming on board so that's taking place right now um, there's been there's a lot of fluid information going on uh, I know there was a uh, news conference today with uh, President Trump's COVID-19 strike team and um, some of the things that they announced today still haven't been pushed through the CDC to us so not everything that they do say on the news does happen so just understand that I was on the phone with one of our school uh, superintendents in the region when I was giving them some guidance that was in contra contradiction to what President Trump just said and what well, we get our information from the CDC it's vetted it's it's tested so we, we go by that so anything I may say tonight it could it could be wrong in an hour okay uh, so one of the things that we are looking towards and we saw today is Governor Lee urged all the schools to close for about two weeks or in, in April uh, even though we, uh, we aren't seeing widespread uh, COVID-19 in our region, uh, we just think it's a matter of time before it happens. We're not, you know, we're not saying that it's not going to happen. Okay. Matter of fact, there is a there is information out there, and our Dr. Kursky, our regional medical directors, and other medical professionals at Ballot and ETSU, we're all waiting for it. We'll we'll, be, we'll get it. We'll get one in the region before it's all said and done, and, and hopefully. Mm -hmm. We're, we're preparing for the worst, hoping for the best, so we hope it doesn't become widespread, but we're seeing that now in other parts of the country, Washington, California, New York, um, and Florida, and other places, and again, we're, see, we're seeing it out in Middle Tennessee, okay? Um, when we talk about community spread, so these people are getting COVID-19 from other people that, are, that have been infected. Uh, the way people can get COVID-19 is through droplets. So if I sneeze on you or I sneeze on a surface that um, that the virus can live on for a little while and I touch that surface, touch my face or put my hands in my mouth, 
that's how it spread, much like the flu. This isn't the flu, but it spread much in the same way. So we, we're telling people that practice good hand hygiene, social distancing, so and don't shake hands. We're doing elbow bumps and foot taps. Uh, you know, don't don't try to shake hands um, and things like that. Uh, try to avoid large crowds. That's why the schools are letting out now. Um, and we're hoping that by the time they get ready to come back, that we don't we aren't seeing widespread transmission. But that's something that you might be looking towards as a planning body for that. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of stop there. If you have any questions for me, I'll be try to glad to try to answer those questions. Yes, sir. There's no vaccine presently uh, available for uh, the coronavirus, uh, and it generated a long-term testing operation before a virus can be approved. I mean, before a vaccine can be approved. Yes. Uh, Eighteen months, maybe. That's what uh, we're being thing, told. This this thing will probably run itself out before we get a vaccine. Is that? No, I don't think. I, well, so what we're looking at, we're hoping that, again, we're hoping for the best. We're hoping that it may act like the flu, the seasonal flu, and that it may start diminishing when we start seeing warmer weather like we do with the seasonal flu. <laughs> However, we're looking at other countries. So look at Iran right now. It's hot over there. It's living. So we don't know. And there's not a, so to say that I think there's maybe over 130 or 40,000 cases worldwide, um, not trying to diminish the, the, the virus, but that's a very small number in, in regards to other diseases that we see, especially like flu. And uh, so we're not really sure what it what it's gonna do. Uh, we're hoping that it'll go down. We're thinking it may, it may diminish and it may be a seasonal thing, maybe. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't know how it, what type of impact it has on the body after you've been infected. So there's a lot of unknowns about it but that we're learning more today. My understanding is this has been around for several years. It just now come up. So there are many different strains of coronavirus. This is a novel coronavirus that's just been identified. So now uh, the other strains of coronavirus is like MERS and, and SARS that we saw many years ago are just another, this is just another strain of that. So it is what we can say, we're calling it a novel, novel virus because it is new. That's why there's no vaccine for it. That's why we're having such a hard time in other parts of the world, in, in China and in Europe, containing it because of the, how it being contagious. Carolyn, you indicated that uh, folks that didn't have a primary care dog could come to the health department tested. What are your criteria for testing? Let's say it's, they present with a fever, they have shortness of breath, uh, is that enough for them to come see you or how are you all dividing that out? Well, let's talk about a, a very new triage guidelines that are, <coughs> that are changing fluidly as well um, and chiming with me, Faye. Um, we're looking for those respiratory symptoms that you mentioned, coughing, uh, shortness of breath, respiratory issues. Um, the health department has actually, can you all hear me? Yeah. I keep going in. Um, the health department has actually um, uh, uh, changed some of their protocol just this afternoon for tomorrow. So we are adjusting the way that we triage <coughs> patients and ask them, you know, about their uh, symptomatic status. Um, at that point, we're going to um, help them get back to their car so that we're protecting our patients who are inside, our babies and our families who are inside. Um, we're going to be sending a nurse out to that car to do some further um, questioning and asking about travel history, uh, that sort of thing. So we're talking about symptomatic folks who may not rise to the level of um, having a test through us. They might be able to access a commercial testing uh, process. Um, if, if a person is symptomatic and they have some travel history and there's some suspicion, then certainly we're going to, you know, want to do that testing. Um, if it is a person who is symptomatic and needs testing but doesn't have that kind of travel or exposure concern, um, then we're going to want them to go to their primary care physician to get tested, same swab as is used to, to test for the flu. Um, if they don't have a primary care physician and they're eligible to receive our health department services because we like everyone else, 
are having to be very deliberate with our supplies. And, and we be deliberate, not, not stingy. So, uh, in being deliberate with those, if they're eligible to get our services, yes, we're going to want to test them. Uh, we're going to want to use a commercial um, process if they don't have that kind of really um, suspicious travel history or exposure potential. So, we're trying to triage kind of high risk, moderate risk, low risk, and we have some recommendations for, um, for patients and customers that visit us like that. Again, um, I think that everybody has been exposed to the um, information, public information about if you are feeling symptomatic before you just head right down to your ER or your doctor's office, please call your primary care physician. If you don't have a primary care physician, please call your health department or the hotline number that is on our tn.gov website. Um, so please use that that local hotline and uh, but yes I think I think several of us are beginning to adjust our procedures and our protocols and uh, we're no different than probably any health healthcare facility in the community. Thank you. Quick question. I know uh tests were kind of hard to come by. Are they even more available? Uh, yes. Um, we we have heard just today on a conference call with our commissioner, Dr. Lisa Piercy, our commissioner of health, um, that swabbing um, can be done by any provider. Again, it's that same swab specimen as to swab for flu. Um, commercial labs are beginning to you know come forth with some additional testing uh, kits and testing uh, supplies. Uh, state does have um, testing supplies again for those symptomatic plus kind of those suspicious you know where there's exposure potential um, so yeah I think we're in a better place than we were again we've got more commercial labs that are coming online with supplies so that is looking much better than it was as far as testing supplies are concerned. Sagans have somebody that tests as positive and they come out of a home that's got somebody that's elderly or somebody's at high risk. What we you do with that person? We just put them in the hospital or do you just have a special place, quarantine, that you can put them right now that you just figured out or? That's a great question. Um, so for the positive patient, they're going to be quarantined for a two week period. Um, Nancy, my, my estimation would be that the family where the positive person is uh -huh. would want to try to take some extra precautions with family members that might be elderly, older, I'm not going to say elderly, take that back, older, our older population, <laughs> like I feel sometimes, our older population and those who are immune compromised. So, the family itself would probably have to be the, the driving force behind protecting those folks within the home a little bit, a little bit more carefully. Well, if, if that's so, would the health department check up and follow up and see that this person is staying quarantined? Absolutely. On positive cases and any other family members that are in this uh, quarantine period, um, we absolutely are getting the reports on the front end about positive cases. Um, I absolutely have had daily contact with the mayor and the EMA director um, for anything that we might um, hear about here. So uh, yes, we would be um, actually taking care of the investigation, not only of the positive contact in their family members, but other social contacts. So we're going to work that as, a, as an investigation to protect the public. Yeah. <laughs> We're a bit confused about uh, testing. There's no need to test unless the symptoms are there, correct? Because you're wasting a test kit. That is correct. Because you've only got a four day incubation period and you could test on Monday negative, but on Friday you could test positive. 
so only only when you show symptoms is it necessary that when you start doing the testing. That's correct. If you if you came to to us or if you called your physician as a, a, someone that was worried, well, you're you're well, you're not experiencing symptoms, you haven't had contact with a positive case, not a presumed, but a positive case, then no, there would not be a testing criteria. That that would not be um, fruitful to test that person. All of you to be commended, you have not licked your fingers. <laughs> well, I talk with my hands until they tell me I can't, you know, use my hands to talk. I'm, I'm good. You know. Thank you, though. Director, the, uh, one of the biggest concerns that I have is our first responders. Yes. They're the most susceptible to confront it before anybody in the public. And you don't hear anything as far as instructions or what they're being trained, if they're being trained, or what uh, equipment they're needing to use. Because our law enforcement, on call, call for service, you know, you never know what you're walking into. What today in your own organization has been identified for the, and for the counties that provide this? Well, I, I think you kind of hit on it when you said they don't ever know what they're going to be walking into. So that means that they're already very prepared and very aware of walking into a potential situation where there's measles or, or um, flu or, or tuberculosis or you know, other things that could be harmful for the responder. Uh, Mayor Barnett just this morning asked on a phone call with Senator Rowe and Dr. Piercy about uh, first responders and PPE. Uh, Dr. Piercy was able to, and Senator Rowe both were able to comment that there are some um, funds that have been released to kind of uh, uh, open that flow and create a little bit more availability of PPE for responders. And, uh, and I don't have a timeline on that, of course, just sharing from this morning's call. And in addition to that, um, I think that uh, uh, healthcare entities have started looking at ways to, um, and, and when I say healthcare entities, I would think that rescue squads, or first responders, EMS, et cetera, would also want to think about measures to conserve their supplies. Um, let me give you a really quick example. We often have a lot of students who round with us, and so each of them uses a mask. Well, we're going to step that down, and they'll not do the rounding part with us so that we don't use and have that extra unnecessary use of supplies at this time. So um, that's kind of two, two parts to, to your question. We did hear that there was some um, Funding and some and some uh, policy behind pushing PPE out for our first responders um, from Senator Rowe and Dr. Piercy, and then we also are locally taking some measures to try to um, be a little bit more frugal with our with our supplies. Any other questions? Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate Thank you for your time. <coughs> If you look at your agenda, it's now time for the public comments. Public comments will be five minutes. There will be no yielding to another individual. It's five minutes only. And it is uh, comments. It's not questions and answers back and forth with the commissioners. And it's, uh, I would also caution and ask that you're speaking to the commissioners as I am now. Do not turn around and speaking to the office. So I appreciate if you respect that very much. So. That being said, do we have anyone who would like to come up to the podium for public comments? Yes, sir, come on up. Please give your name and address if you would, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jim McGee. I live at 127 Reach Crest Drive, up on the hill across from Happy Valley Memorial Cemetery. I've been here before this legislative body 
four or five times in the past four years. My wife has a numerous health problems. I have a few of them. She spent the whole month of November at Duke University Medical Center in ICU critical care. The reason I bring that part out, stress is a deadly thing. I have a situation where I live and I have all the documents and everything right here to prove. I have faced so many times that the Sheriff's Department has sent deputies out, or 911 actually, I guess, would send the deputies out. And just this past Thursday night, I had taken some things to the Johnson City Medical Center for people to use. I got back home about 9 o'clock. At about 9, 10, 9, 15, there was a rap on the door and I had a deputy that was telling me, you're parking on private, private property. I said, no. And he said, well, you need to remove the vehicle or we're gonna have it towed. I had put up that crap all the time and I have been as courteous and kind and there is a half dozen of you in here, or more, that's well aware of this situation. If we can't work something out reasonably, I can work it out, and I intend to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McGee. Anyone else would like to come up and speak? Anyone else? Stand up and we'll move ahead with the agenda. At this time, we'll go ahead with Mr. Flannery, the U.S. Department of Commerce. He's going to come up and speak about the census and the importance of that. Appreciate you being here, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invite, the commissioners. Thank you. Thank you for the public for being here. Um, a lot of people think, oh great, it's going to be the census. How boring can that be? I can tell you, it, it can be boring at times, um, but right now it's not. Um, the census just kicked off last Thursday. Some of you have probably received a postcard or letter in the mail. Um, I can give you an updated status operation for you. It's working right now. Um, you'll receive that in the mail if you haven't already. Uh, you'll have an option that you'll be able to go on there and do a link. There's a link you can go online for the first time ever and do the census. I can tell you the people that worked with me went and did it the other day. It took them five, six minutes. So we were telling everybody this past year, David, you know, we've been on your radio show and we appreciate you letting us talk to Carter County about that. Um, we said it was going to take about 10 minutes and it's taken less than 10 minutes. So, you know, usually when you roll something out, like they were talking, you hope for the best. Um, so it is it's tracking right now. Um, one other option you have to do the census is you can do it on, um, you can call in as well. There's a toll free number that you can call in. Um, I can tell you right now, uh, a few people I know have done that and they said it was really easy, um, but it's a little more time consuming. They said it took like 10 or 12 minutes because whoever, when you call in, they have to read you a script with each question. So it's a little more time consuming than doing it online, but that option is there. Um, and you can always mail it in. So, so why is it important? Well, I, I'll just get right down to it. Um, Money-wise, there was a uh, study done a few years ago by George Washington University, and we always cite this because this is not census data that I'm telling you. It's the um, George Washington University. Um, we feel, as a census bureau, we feel the number's actually higher than what I'm getting ready to tell you, so you can take it to the bank, this number's safe. Um, for every person in the state of Tennessee who does not uh, participate in the survey for the census, it costs about $1,091 you lose in federal funding. Uh, now, Tennessee is the median state based on that study, so I can tell you that, uh, I 
think it's Nevada, it's about $520 a day lose per person, and it ranges all the way up to Vermont of about $2,300. So Tennessee is the average for the nation at $1,091. Well, to save you some of the math on this, I can tell you in 2010 was the last census, and now this was without an online option, without a phone in option. This was just mail in only. Carter County, um, your all's percentage was 82.6% participation. Now, that's pretty good, um, but let me, let me mention this. It is a law. <laughs> so, you think uh, adherence would be a little bit higher, uh, but um, we understand that it's not. Um, so, 82.6% um, of your population in 2010 was 57,388 people. If you look at 82.6%, that leaves us with what, 17.4%? That's almost 10,000 people in Carter County did not participate. Um, if you look at 1,091 a person, you all are losing, and it's safe to say, $10.9 million a year in federal funding. Now that's through the top 55 uh, federal entities that um, dis distribute money to the states. Now, let me say this, I'm from here, I'm from Washington County. Although I work for the federal government, I want all the money we can get to come back here. And that's why I'm very passionate about this. I've always worked in either law enforcement, military, or veteran affairs. And I thought, well, this might be boring going to the Census Bureau. So when I start seeing these numbers and saw how much money we're losing as a region, um, it's pretty, it's pretty appalling. So. If you're losing $10 million a year, you can't get it right to the next census, which is going to be another 10 years. That's $100 million. That's Carter County's missing in, in a 10-year period. Now, the other counties, obviously, Sullivan County's missing more and Washington County, but your populations are higher. Um, I can tell you that Johnson County and Unicoi County are both losing about $3 million, but that's comparable based on their population. So for them to lose $3 million and so we can lose 20 some million and it's about the same range. So um, we have no loyalty to any party. We have no loyalty to any branch of government. Our loyalty is to the Constitution. It's in the Constitution and uh, since 1790, we have conducted an annual census and we will do so this year. Um, we are having some uh, hurdles to go through right now with the coronavirus, I'll be honest. Um, a lot of our events are getting canceled. And I had to call Abby today to make sure y'all are still having your event because they're dropping, was dropping like flies. I mean, the way it's happening right now. And we understand that. The good thing about this, and, and you'll see people ask, well, will the census go on? Yes, the census is going to go on. Um, you can do that from home. You do not have to go out in public to do it. And one thing we are doing to help people who want to do it online, and may not have Wi-Fi, or just may not be, um, computer literate or that mess with computers much, we are setting up mobile uh, questionnaire assistance stations and we've got several places in Carter County we'll be doing that. Those are on hold right now. Um, they're wanting to reassess that part of it until this coronavirus, we get through the next few weeks and see. Um, but you all will be able to do it from home. It, it's a non-issue with that. Um, will people come to your door? That's another question because people always say, well, Census Bureau, they come to your house. If you do this, if you go online and do this in five minutes, census people will never come to your house. The only time they're going to come would be here in probably a month and a half. They'll start doing what we call non-response follow-up. When they come, they're just coming. They're, they're going to ask you those same basic questions that you would have done in those five minutes online. Um, so why, you may think, well, why do we have um, issues with people participating? Some people don't trust the government. I get it. I get it. Uh, rightfully so sometimes, I'll say it, um, on, on certain issues. Um, but I can tell you, this is probably the most secure information you'll ever give someone. We can't share it with any camp, federal, uh, state, or local law enforcement agencies. If ICE, if um, NSA, CIA, FBI, any of them want information from us, they won't get it. I mean, it's absolutely, and that's that's mandated that we're not sharing that information. Now, convincing somebody back here in some of these hollers where I hunt and stuff, they don't believe it when I tell them, and I know them. So I'm like, uh, but yeah, I, I can tell you, we take it dead serious. If any of us were to even share, like, I don't, I don't do the counting or the numeration. I just, my job is to get the word out about it. But 
Um, if we were going to share a middle name, it's $250,000 fine, five years in prison. And I can tell you, because I used to work for the Department of Corrections, I don't need to go to prison. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I definitely don't want to go into my street cred beat if I shared somebody's middle name, you know. Uh, not like that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I will tell you all this. Um, for, for Carter County, y'all have been great. We've got some great partners over here, and I want to thank them while I'm here. Kev, Dr. Kevin Ward, thank you so much for um, what Carter County School System's done for us. They've done a lot of, um, let me come present at your office, what, orientation, seven, eight hundred um, faculty members there to talk about, you know, how important it is counting kids. You know, I'll add something to that while we're on the kids. Um, so our lowest or hardest to count population is children, um, specifically five years and younger. Um, reason being, and you all probably guess most of them, some of them are grandparents who are raising a child and they think, well, I'm not a biological parent, I don't have custodial rights. Um, if they live in your house, yes, you can count them and you should. Um, or you may have parents who are divorced and they say, well, this one claimed on taxes this year, so they should be the one counting. They get lost in the mix. Um, and a lot of people just don't realize that. But that money that comes back, and when I say it comes back, it wasn't given to us by the federal government, that was money you paid. So we want to get as much back as possible. Um, if, if a kid's a day old or if somebody's 110 years old, it's the same average that comes back here. Um, I can tell you this, that money will go somewhere. There's $675 billion that is dispersed annually based on the results of this census. Now, it's not like the federal government's going to say, oh, well, they didn't respond. Let's just put this over here and we'll save it. No, it's, it's going somewhere. So if you don't want it to go to California, if you don't want it to go to New York or Florida and some of these other states, you want to come back to East Tennessee, take five minutes and get $1,100 back for your community. Um, I want to thank Mayor Barnett, Abby, um, David for having us on the show to be able to put that out because people do listen to radio still a lot. I mean, they get a lot of their information that way. I um, mean, you all mentioned uh, Miles Cook. I don't know if I should admit that I'm really good friends with him. So I don't know if that's good or bad. If I need to escort out of here or in here. Um, but do you all have any questions? Hmm. How does our response rate percentage compare to the other counties? Are you saying we're on par with the other ones at I can, 2.6? I, I can tell you as far as the, all right, I'm, I'm a supervisor over 47 counties. I've got counties all the way from near Nashville to here. I predominantly work five, or Johnson, Unicoi, Carter, Sullivan, Washington. You all are, like right in the middle, those range anywhere from 80, 82.6, to 84.9, so they're pretty comparable. Um, I can tell you <clears throat> our harder to count areas, what we consider a low response score area, they are in Washington County. Um, the hardest to count are near downtown Johnson City, um, a few in Kingsport and one in Bristol. Surprisingly, the rural communities aren't as hard to count as you think. Um, I don't know if it's just people, I don't know, I don't know what the difference is. Um, I can tell you, for here's an example, we have, um, and you all can pull it up, it's not a secret, it's called Rome, it's remote, <clears throat> on their remote something area mapper, um, look on census.gov, if you go on there you can pull it up and it'll show you certain areas where they anticipate based on 2010 and based on other data that they use, that response might be low. So when I've met with Johnson County um, Complete Count Committee, I've talked to them and, you know, I thought maybe Shady Valley, maybe some of those areas. The hardest count area for Johnson County is Butler. I mean, it's absolutely that section right there. And you don't know, you know, you don't always know why. And, um, but, yeah, we can narrow it down and that's the areas we work hard. So, speaking of working it, um, some of y'all probably seen our recruiters over here during the last year. Um, we are still hiring. Um, we're about to wrap that phase up, up of it. Um, I can tell you that once we reach 80% of our applicant goal, we consider that county green. Carter County's not green yet. You all are like at 76%. I think we need maybe 30 some more applicants. I don't do the recruiting, but I do put the word out for them. So if you all know anybody who's interested in applying, um, they can go to census.gov. And I'm not gonna throw in the front slash and all that because you're not gonna remember. If you just remember to go to the census website, they get on there and um, they can apply. Um, they'll make, for Carter County, it's $13.50 an hour and $0.58 cents a mile fuel reimbursement. 
So the jobs are two to four months, they're part time, um, and they work up to 30 hours a week. So, any questions? So, <clears throat> if someone wants to go online and fill it out, they just go to census.gov, and there'll be a place where they can click on the fill the Oh, you're about to do the survey? Yes. So now, if you receive it in the mail, you'll have a link, and I'll tell you that don't don't, don't stress out about whether you got that link or not. If you got the link and you go on there, all that will do is if you sign up with that, it'll pre-populate your address. If you don't have that, you can go to 2020census.gov is what you would go to to do the actual survey. Um, if you go on there, you can put your address in and then it'll pull you up. Yeah. What about the age? Age 18. For report? So um, you have to be 18, um, at least as of the day that you're hired. And we just started really reaching out to Carter County High Schools to put some recruiters in down to help. And then they sent students home. So that's what we're facing. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to find good help like that. So I, I'm going to leave this. Be the commissioner to have if you want to make more copies. This, what I'm showing you here, this is based on that same study that I had discussed. This shows where approximately $17.3 billion comes to Tennessee. So anybody in here, when you think about, if I say that this money goes to roads, healthcare, schools, that all sounds generic. It goes, it filters in, well that's nice, but you don't know any details. I can tell you, uh, based on this, it'll tell you exactly where this money goes. So since most of us can't phantom $17 billion, when you think about that, this is broken down into each department in Tennessee how much they got. Now that's not each region, it's not every city, this is just the department. So I'll just give you a few examples. $110 million a year goes to school breakfast program. About $230 million a year goes to school lunch program. Um, this is SNAP benefits, WIC benefits, um, it's all listed within here. So this, and, and Rusty will probably agree, this has got their attention, you know, most mayors, they see where that money goes, and it's, it's quite astonishing. So, um, it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's valid. I didn't just type up some random numbers for you. Um, but this is good, that way you can kind of see where the money goes. And, and then I've had people ask me, well, who decides where the money goes? I said, well, that's where elections go. So that's a whole different, whole different story there to decide who gets what. Any more questions? Thank you. All right. Thank y'all for having us. <laughs> if you look at your agenda, we're down to the presentation of recognizing students in Carter County Schools and recent form Battle of the Bills, Mayor of the Bills. Uh, if you guys would, anyone that's on that team, if you would come forward uh, at this time, we'll, we'll make room up here somewhere. We'll do a little presentation. Uh, Dr. Ward, uh, Mr. Crane, uh, Mr. Bowers, uh, a few other school board members that are trying to get around. guys through the year and, and uh, on another little project they, some of them helped out with our substation up in the Del Mills uh, Miss, Miss Whitby, yes Lila's chairman of education she came up and told me well, sure, yeah, I'm sorry yeah. I, I was thinking Miss McCain uh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, Miss Layla you leave and we forget about you already <laughs> <laughs> anybody else I need to get up I don't believe anybody out anyway, I was uh I don't know, I don't have words. Just the, we had a little video we was going to try to show, but we didn't want to you know, mess up everything. But, uh, so we didn't get to show it, but they built this 72 Volkswagen Beetle and had a grill in it. 
gas grill. And I would have bought it in a heartbeat if I, I wouldn't have got killed when I got home with it. But uh, they sold it. And uh, some people out of, I think, Knox County or Knoxville bought it. And, uh, but it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I was walked around it, and there was nobody close. I mean, there was nobody close to what they did. But anyway, uh, we want to recognize them. Uh, they're from all of our schools, different schools. Uh, uh, it's called working together. I mean, they, they beat each other up on Friday nights or something on footballs. But when they come this, uh, they all work together. Uh, well, not the ladies, they play football. But, uh, anyway, uh, we got a little, uh, first of all, I want to recognize the teachers. Uh, Mr. Daniel Arnett from Hampton. Uh, he's got the CAD program up there, and, and it's just amazing. Uh, we got uh, Mr. James Monroe uh, from Happy Valley. I think you do the electrical, electrical yes. part of it. And then we got uh, Mr. Scotty Johnson from uh, Unica, uh, does the body work. And uh, Mr. Potter's not here, is he? They helped he do the welding, some of the welding. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Sam Potter from Cloud, and they did the welding. So it was a, it was a team effort. So. Uh, uh, I was up there right before they started painting, and I said, there's no way this is going to work again. I mean, I thought, but it, when I got over there, it was, it was beautiful. Anyway, uh, I'd like to recognize these uh, students for a job well done. Three years in a row that they have uh, won the championship. Well, it's just been three years. They've had it going on for three years, right? And they've won it all three years, and I just, I don't, I wonder what they're going to do to beat this next year. I mean, there's just there's a lot of pressure on them. What are they going to do? To, uh, they're going to do something. They did the pool table last year or something, and it was just, uh, anyway, uh, I'd like to hand these out. Uh, certificate of recognition. Dr. Ward, you want, you want to hand these out? Uh, first, Brandon Ward. Lindsey Grindstaff, is that right, Lindsey? Yes. Now this lady here starches my shirts at uh, cleaners, <laughs> and, and I walked I walked in up there the night at Unica High School about about nine thirty ten o'clock, and, and and there she was. She had, she had painted uh, the hood and the fenders, and you know, she did a lot of the painting on this vehicle. I thought, wow, you know. It's, Impressed because she, you know, I just thought she worked at the dry cleaner, but she can paint too. And uh, so somebody's going to hire her, I'm sure. Somebody will hire her. I mean, I'm not going to single her out, but I was amazed by it. Anyway, uh, Seth Williams. Trevor Hyde. Not here, okay. Casey Blevins, look like a P, yeah, look like a P to me. Joe Marklin, Joe's a little bit shy. He, <laughs> he, he, can, he can talk to anybody. I watched him, he can, he's a talker. Yeah, he's, he, he ought to be in that public speaking, but he's. Uh, Joseph Huskins. Peyton Phillips, okay. Nicholas Sweeney, Lake and Lines, McKinley Coon. Nathan Barton. Now here's the guy that can really draw plans in the, the CAD program. He, I mean, they all can do it, but he, I saw him firsthand. He, he's got a good future ahead of him in the engineering or whatever, some kind of world anyway. Heather Grindstaff. This lady here is the state, no, the regional, regional champ 
in public speaking, and I don't know about now, but it was the cancel everything. She would have been the state champion, but uh, but she uh, she was the regional champion in public speaking. Marcus Crow. Okay, not here. Paige Greer. James Holland. Jocelyn Jardin. Jargon, not here. Get everybody. <laughs> anyway, uh, Anyway, uh, I'll let I'll move out of the way and let Dr. Ward say a word or two because uh, this is his. This is his uh, I'm just going to say congratulations once again to the uh, young men and women that uh, stand before you in these uh, three. And I think there's, uh, like I said, Sam uh, is missing. I think after seeing these three gentlemen tonight, we're going to change our policy next month where our uh, CTE teachers has to wear suit and ties. So you know, <laughs> 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 he back to high school, and his wife was uh, looking at me earlier and saying, "Please don't, please don't. It's hard enough to keep them clean the way it is." <laughs> but they look good. They look real good. And uh, you know, the uh, amazing thing is this uh, third time, second. The third year in a row, okay. First year, it was a chicken coop, a portable chicken coop, okay. And then uh, last year, it was a uh, pool table in the back of a 64 Chevrolet, something like that. And this year, did, did all of you get to see the, uh, the uh, work that they did? And uh, say something about this young lady here that uh, done the paint job went over there and looked, and that was one of the slickest paint jobs I think I'd ever seen. And uh, she was standing there next to it, and I said something, in the effect, who painted this? And she said, I did. And uh, did you win state tournament last year in the painting? In, in this way, okay. But uh, these young men and women, they have a lot of uh, great potential, a lot of good things ahead of them. Uh, this young man right here, uh, actually paid, uh, wasn't trying to get a freebie, but he drew up some plans for me and got the, uh, got the unit built and it fell down three days later, so we went to have a little discussion, so I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm starting yet. Uh, but no, the work that he did uh, uh, for me, uh, you know, and, and working on that CAD program, uh, let me let uh, Mr. Arnett uh, introduce and say anything he wants to. And uh, congratulations on three year running. Uh, can you do it the fourth time? It's a little harder and harder every year, don't it? Uh, well, uh, I'll let you. <laughs> um, I'd like to say we left off one young man, A.J. Carver. Um, he's, he's standing over there. We've left his name off. Uh, so beside me is Mr. Scott Johnson. And Mr. James Monroe. Thank you all. Supervisor, and I forgot Miss Layla, but she's she's the chairman of the uh, education committee. So, Miss Miss Brown. I just like to say to Mr. Johnson, I know you've got it in it to do it next year even better. We're very proud of you, every one of you. Miss Woodby, Miss Woodby. I just want to say congratulations to some extremely talented young men and women. I did get to witness that project, and it was great. The paint job was exceptional. <laughs> commend this young lady for that. And I also would like to stress to the elected officials in the room how important this group, all of our children in this 
community are. They are number one. That is the top priority of this county. So congratulations. Anybody else in the commission who may have got anything to say? Yes? I'd just like to say that uh, we're not sure Dr. Moore doesn't have uh, coronavirus. Therefore, <laughs> <laughs> all of you that shook hands with him should line up and wash your hands. <laughs> yes, sir. Guys, next year I encourage you to video this stuff as you go through and do it and then put it out on YouTube. There's a lot of people who really interested in what you're doing. Uh, they, they do have it, we just didn't hook it up tonight, but they've got a video and uh, it's about five inches long. We can get it out to you guys if you want it, but, uh, but like I say, uh, it, starts, it starts right here and this is, uh, this is what we got right here. Uh, this, uh, they're looking, all looking good. So we want to say thank you very much for making Carver County proud. Thank you very much.
Emma Carpenter has been chosen to represent Carter County in Washington, D.C. as an ambassador for policy change as part of the SAD Speaks initiative. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Clark County Mayor Russ Bonnet, do hereby declare March 30 through April 5, 2020, as National Drug and Alcohol Facts Week in Carter County, Tennessee, and I encourage all citizens to join me in this worthy observance. Make a motion to accept. Second. Mr. Brown, second. Mr. Fraser. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, this is Miss Jillian Reese and who's the young lady? Emma Carpenter. Baseball to continue operating the Appalachian Baseball Minor League. 
Mr. Lusses and Drew, one of Larry Stonewood, Commissioner Chip, Travis Hill, Second Commissioner Johnson. Any discussion on the resolution before we? Any discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Resolution passed. Thank you. Mayor, it's time for your uh, report, sir, if you want to come on out. <coughs> okay, this is a little, uh, it'll be kind of brief. Uh, Dr. Acuff, probably, he might want to mention this uh, forensic, uh, toss it down a little bit since we negotiated our the pay 18 months ago so it's going to be coming up again uh, the next fiscal year uh, so we're going to start negotiating again they said no more than two and a half percent more I think two, two and a half percent rates no more so we're starting negotiating we're going to try to get about about one percent or something we'll, we'll negotiate that we're going to start negotiating about that trying to get as low as possible but uh, uh, had five autopsies this this month. So uh, uh, okay, uh, I'm sure Dr. Acuff will also address. Uh, we got good news from Blue Cross. He'll he'll address that. I, I'd love to, but I, I just love to let the chairman do there, so because this is really good. Uh, I've been in conferences all day today with from the governor down to Dr. Rowe, down to the health department, to emergency management. Uh, so uh, uh, we're working on a couple of things. Uh, we're shutting the schools down after tomorrow. So I talked to Dr. Ward. Uh, we, had a, we had a good discussion about, it's good that they're gonna feed these students at the five different schools. It's good that they're going to do that. My concern is the ones that can't get to the school. They have to do a drive-by and they hand it to them. So after I talked to, with Dr. Ward's blessings, I don't do anything without their blessings, I contacted Dr. Rowe's office uh, and Governor Lee's office. It's a federal thing, but I want to get to Governor Lee. He's, he declared a state of emergency, so uh, he should be involved in this. Somehow we should get this waived. Uh, it's a, there's a federal federal guidelines won't allow them to get people to take the meals to their house. I don't like. I don't agree with that. I mean, you know, there won't be as many not be able to get to the schools that are going to be able to come by and get a meal. A lot of them may be left home by themselves. They says the, the rule is you have to put it in their hands. So. Um, supposed to get calls back in the morning, or hopefully the morning from Dr. Rowe's office and Governor Leeds to see if we can get by with somehow. I mean, run run the bus routes, run put people on the buses, hand these to these kids that can't make it there. But it's just that's just one suggestion. But we got people that will volunteer to take these to the. You know, we got a lot of people up in the hollers and way up that, that can't get to the schools and. Uh, so Dr. Ward's working on it. He'll probably talk about it a little bit, but uh, we are in the works trying to get, if it's a state of emergency, this is an emergency to get those kids fed, you know? So we're working on that to try to get some food to those kids that can't make it to the schools. Uh, the Election Commission has got a box collecting like food, and, you know, food, canned food, stuff like that. Um, I hope that's okay. They called and asked me about it I said, it's, it's, it's good for me, you know, to you know, bring the king goods and stuff. So, uh, Hampton Utility Water had an opening for a commissioner, and I always go with the other two recommendation. Uh, who they, I tell them that the ones, you know, give me a list of the ones they recommend. They feel like they can work with the best. So. Uh, I appointed Brian White back to the Water Authority again. Um, I think he's the chairman presently, but I put him back on it to serve this another term. And uh, last thing, 
had the electric system come, met them over there uh, in the front parking lot. The judges and some of the people over there were concerned about the lighting in the front of the jail. And I um, met with the electric system and uh, they did a little survey. We need like two poles. We'll light that thing up like Fort Knox. Uh, I asked them about LED. They said they don't have LEDs around, but they can get them. So uh, I requested to get the LEDs. And uh, we put like three lights on one pole, four on the other. Probably gonna run us around 20, 20 bucks a light fixture. So we're talking about uh, 140 a month. That, that's pretty reasonable, Ross. The high. Ours are, I guess it's 400 watt or something like that. One of those. Our price is about 15 bucks. We have LED options, but I mean, yeah. that's the reason we'll set it all also. So. Okay, but I mean, we may be a little cheaper, but I don't think you can get around that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. Well, that's not that price match. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's, uh, I guess I got something else to negotiate on. <laughs> I, I, I can negotiate a little bit, I don't mean I'll get my way, but uh, I'll say, John C. said they can do it for 10. <laughs> we'll sell for 15. <laughs> so anyway, but, uh, but they, that's just an estimate, you know, uh, everyone sets polls and uh, uh, that's just an estimate, so uh, maybe we get a little cheaper than that but, uh, when I talk to them again. Uh, other than that, uh, any questions for me? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Went to our committee report. Yeah. Yeah. Last week, Mr. Brown, Chairman Brown, Mr. Chairman Brown. Ray, I think your mic's cut out again. Is it asked? No, maybe it's a little bit. Is that a friend? You're some alto. I've got to move quick, apparently. Um, I'll start off, this was included in the packet. I, mean, I think everybody got one of those. Uh, we talked at budget committee about we had Raymond James came in and did a uh, presentation for us. Looks like a good plan to uh, refinance our debt service. Uh, this, we made the decision as a budget committee to move it forward, put the RFP out there. Brad's working on that. Doesn't mean we're going with Raymond James. Uh, depends on, I guess, who submits any kind of bid for uh, interest in that. Uh, looks really good, could save us up to about $2 million possibly, and that would certainly depend on the market and kind of what rate goes in at that time. Um, yeah, which page that is, but uh, let's see, there's a timeline. Refinancing process on about page 12, and it has to go through a lot of steps, through the comptroller's office, of course, the RFP uh, process. And down to about, so you can receive credit rating and then execute, execute marketing plan. We can, we can turn that down at any time from <coughs> to, to about the exec, execute marketing plan. So if it comes and we realize we don't like it or the rate goes bad or something like that, we can always have that option to, to turn it down. Uh, so looks like a good thing. We moved it on, so they're working on it. We won't take any action as far as full committee. Uh, then we'll move on to amendments here. I will, the first one, I'll start out, and this is a lease from the Sheriff's Department. And I will put the form of a motion to approve a three-year master lease agreement for three vehicles for the Sheriff's Department. Uh, annual payments on this $15,527.98, and they got a couple of accounts that they're transferring money on that. Second, Mr. Frazier. Any discussion? Uh, next item, I'll put the form of a motion to approve the purchase and installation of a new server for the circuit court clerk's office, total $8,200, and they've got several accounts of reserve funds uh, to pay for this, no new money. Second, second, Commissioner James. Discussion? Discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. up with the budget amendments so you got the packet there if you want to follow those we've got any questions uh, 
first one, I'll make a motion to approve General Fund 101, amendment number 8, 17 items, total $45,898, uh, $898.83. This is actually $12,677.77 is an increase to our general fund balance on that. Second. Commissioner James, second the motion. Discussion? Discussion? Please call the roll. Next item, I'll put a term of motion to approve solid waste and sanitation fund 116, amendment 7, a uh, total of $3,500, nothing from fund balance. Commissioner James, second. Discussion? Discussion, seeing none. Next item, I'll put the form of a motion to approve sports and recreation fund 123, amendment 4. Total of $50,200, nothing for the fund balance. There is a second. Commissioner Travis Hill, second. Discussion? Discussion? Follow up, please. Motion passed. Thank you. Next item, I'll put the form of a motion to approve Highway and Public Works Fund 131, amendment number 8, a total of $785,227.11, uh, $10,357.98 coming from the unassigned fund balance. Thank you. Commissioner Nancy Brown, second. Discussion? Any discussion? I will say that that's to cover some matching grants for two bridges that they're going to work on Dennis Cove and uh, Outer Branch. Uh, the ranch is supposed to close by March 24th or so. So, the uh, sign's up the 23rd, it'll be closed the 24th, it will be $20. Okay. I'll go for it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Please call the roll. Motion passed. Thank you. Next item, I'll put in the form of a motion to approve general purpose school fund 141, <laughs> amendment 7A. A total of $153,250.98, uh, nothing from the general purpose school fund balance. Very good. Second, Commissioner Collins. Any discussion? Seeing none, the public will The voice right there, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I go, I go with the voice and the hand. Reveal. Oh, you are reveal. Oh, All right, yes. Yeah. 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 That is name back. <laughs> uh, next right. item, I'll put the form of motion to approve General Purpose School Fund 141 Amendment 8. <coughs> and this is a total of $172,630.52. Uh, Thirty-two thousand six ninety-one fifty-one from the general purpose school fund balance. Commissioner Blevin, second the motion. <laughs> There's discussion. Any discussion? See it. Discussion. Commissioner Hill. Hey Brandon, they they get that straight out and let them mark out, but we end up getting more than what Gary thought we got. Uh, actually, we have we haven't received anything. We've got the approvals. Okay. Any other questions? Motion passed. Right, next stop in the form of a motion to approve school federal projects fund 142 amendment 6. Total $3,500. Nothing from fund balance. Second. You're a second. Commissioner James, second. No discussion. Any discussion? All of them, please. Uh, next item, uh, put in the form of a motion to approve the monetary donations made to the animal shelter, nine hundred dollars, and to the school department, two hundred dollars. Second. Mr. Proposer, second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Mm -hmm.
Last one is a motion to approve the non monetary donations made to Animal Shelter, a value of 636.26. Second. Who was that? I'm sorry. Commissioner Fraser, second. Discussion? Seeing none, we'll come on. And also have a note uh, from the committee the other night, we did uh, make a motion to move forward with an RFP for the circuit clerk's office. They had some records that uh, they kind of got damaged a little bit. We're working on uh, getting some estimates and doing some research on that to take care of that. Uh, I'll jump into Keep Car County Beautiful real quick. Uh, we had a Tweetsie Trail planning Saturday. Uh, City of Elizabeth really helped us out on that. There's about 14, 15 trees. A few shrubs at three different locations. Uh, one there, Big John's, kind of not the main entrance, but to the side where there's a, a, a car lot there. I'm not sure who owns that, but uh, looks good there. One behind downtown, kind of uh, Dino's and Cannons on the back side of it of downtown. Looks good at the city impound lot. So if you're out, check them out. Turned out really good though. City of Elizabeth and Doug Hulse Forest with their men equipment, so that, that helped a lot. Got their bikes back. Um, We'll meet tomorrow, 5.30, I guess, if everything's all scheduled for meetings around here, if anybody would like to attend. Uh, and I'll move to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, if you haven't heard, Director Stevens has stepped down. She's taken a new position. Uh, so there are kind of preliminary stages with the Executive Board on looking for a new director in the Chamber of Commerce. So, what, what did you say to the meeting tomorrow, 5.30? Keep guard Mr. Travis Hill. They, they did cancel the legislative breakfast, correct? That's correct, yeah. I found that's coming up pretty quick. I think Monday is. It's Friday. Friday. Friday, yes. That has been, uh, not sure if it's been rescheduled. I don't know much about it, but it's certainly not going on Friday. Anything else, sir? That's all we've got. Thank you very Thank you. Much. Bill on the grounds. Very well. Thank you, sir. Education. Uh, we uh, think just a few minutes here to give you an update on full board uh, the situation in the school systems that relates to this uh, coronavirus. Um, uh, first of all, I think they've been left. Uh, our local health department. Um, what's the lady's name? Caroline. 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 Uh, she has been very, very helpful. I want to commend her and uh, and Dr. Kirschke. He has been very helpful. Matter of fact, I was on the phone with Dr. Kirschke probably about six different times between Friday and late Sunday afternoon, and then today, this morning, uh, another two or three times. He had a conference call today at 11 o'clock that uh, was very helpful. Um, you know, when it comes to something like this, You've got to look and seek guidance of those uh, professionals. And uh, once I uh, uh, met Dr. Kursky some years back, realized and understood what his resume was. He came from the CDC, was hired by I guess, the regional health people. And uh, so uh, when when he uh, talked, when he made suggestions, I really uh, I really paid attention. Last week in our discussions, he was saying that uh, you know right now he said we don't have any community. Uh, um, outbreaks or no community symptoms. Uh, he said right now, he said, my, my recommendation is let's just hold firm. Uh, that was early last week. And uh, he said uh, the way it's trending, he said we are looking like sometime in the first, second week of May is about when we might need to make a decision. Well, meantime, uh, today, prior to his 11 o'clock uh, um, conference call with Dr. Kirschke and some other health officials, uh, we had gotten word this morning that uh, uh, the governor had called an emergency meeting with his staff and then uh, sometime I guess after around 11 o'clock or so the governor released uh, his statement that, that uh, pretty much uh, encouraged uh, uh, the schools to uh, go ahead and look closed until March 31st and that was uh, once we uh, understood that um, that's the action plan we put in place. What, we, uh, what we've been doing for the last uh, two weeks, or uh, I guess uh, two, three weeks, uh, based on CDC recommendations instead of the guidelines, um, we have been uh, really just preparing. Um, 
as of uh, last week on Thursday or Friday, we had uh, we had all of our plans and package ready. Uh, our kids uh, they will be able to go home and uh, at the high school level and at the elementary level and use the uh, PDF files. We'll also have uh, folders made for those kids who don't have internet access to where they can pick up materials. Their parents can come by the schools and pick up school uh, uh, work and materials for them to have some academics to uh, work on. What we decided to do is put in there a lot of review uh, from uh, first day of school up until about uh, you know where we're at right now, mid mid March, and uh, just uh, you know try to make the best of uh, what we could. The uh, the other part of the plan was feeding, and I've got a handout here that uh, I'll give to you to follow up on Mayor Barnett's uh, 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 discussion about the uh, school feeding program. What uh, the state uh, and working with the feds on the school feed program. What, uh, what they have done, they restricted the guidelines for where the students didn't have to come inside the building and sit in the cafeteria and eat like that, like our summer feed program. <coughs> Under these circumstances, it was uh, the governor's office and the federal uh, government was uh, real, uh, has relaxed some of the guidelines because they want, uh, they want the kids to uh, uh, be fed uh, during outage. Now, one of the things that you need some more copies. I think we got it. Got it I didn't get one. Um, you'll pass one around. Yes. Uh, what the federal they they did release uh, or relieve some of the requirements or the guidelines, and that was that uh, we could do drive through. So basically, uh, what we'll be doing is starting Wednesday uh, from one o'clock. Um, I'm sorry, from noon to one o'clock, Monday through Friday, we'll have drive-through uh, meal pickup uh, at each one of the four, five locations that we have listed there at the bottom of the page. Cloudland Elementary, Hampton High School, Hunter Elementary, Hampton uh, Valley, oh, I'm sorry, Hampton Valley Elementary and Little Belkin. Uh, these meals are for, for uh, zero to 18. Uh, no income or guidelines or anything that affects that, they just come by and pick up a meal and we will be showing them out uh, of these five locations to get them in their hands. Uh, Mayor Barnett did call me today and uh, uh, we had a, uh, a discussion and uh, I was pleased to hear that he has uh, made contact with uh, Mr. Rowe's office. If something can be done and we can uh, do uh, do something additional in terms of trying to get these out into the hands uh, of the children in the community, um, we will uh, work with our people at the office and, and uh, make the arrangements to try to do so. But they will have to, uh, you know, uh, wait for relaxing more of the guidelines because right now we have to, it's a drive through program. Uh, and then uh, right here, I'll just go ahead and give you. that uh, we released this morning once the uh, Governor League come out. Uh, we will be closed from Wednesday, March 18th through Tuesday, March 31st. The reason we uh, closed from Wednesday uh, uh, through the 31st is we needed half a day today to get our principals in and get everything organized. Uh, two weeks ago we had uh, Dr. Bowers and uh, she worked with the K-8 uh, Mr. McLean, he worked with the high school to get all the academic plans ready and prepared to go home with the kids. So we needed uh, about a day and a half in order to get everything in the kids' hands and uh, go ahead and get them, uh, get them out of school. So as of uh, tomorrow will be our last day until the 31st. And then once we, uh, I guess, get somewhere in around the 27th, 28th, we're going to reevaluate and see where we're at with this uh, with the spread of this virus, and uh, we'll be making uh, uh, decisions at that time as to whether to come on back on April 1st or uh, or uh, look for uh, uh, more time off. So uh, only time will tell. Uh, and during the, um, of course, uh, the second paragraph is just uh, of what I just hinted just those feeding locations. The instructional plans will be uh, worked through. Uh, 912 on the Google Classroom. We have uh, postponed the ACT test. 
uh, because we figure that after the announcement this morning, we will have a very low attendance tomorrow. Uh, parents will keep their kids at home, but uh, we do have several uh, dates in the near future for uh, for makeup for the ACT. Uh, the additional information was provided the link for the CDC website uh, to uh, for parents to be able to go to. Now, we put this in a press release so the news media has it. We put it in our system Facebook page or Twitter account. Um, the system web page and uh, we also at the end of the day or toward the uh, end of today we uh, we did one call to uh, make the announcement uh, of what uh, our decision uh, was in terms of code closing so uh, that's where we're at are there any questions yes sir not really a question but more of a comment is it not possible that if they could further relax the requirements on the kids getting meals and stuff like that, would it be feasible to use you use the bus drivers to deliver those meals rather than having because putting the kids on the bus and bringing them to the school is going to completely defeat the purpose of social isolation, but using the bus to deliver those yeah. could yeah. potentially lead to yeah. that. Yeah, if the, if the guidelines were restricted, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead, Mr. McClain. I, I think the conversation that we had was around putting it on the buses right. and taking it to the homes, not having students on the bus. Yeah. And I want to add one more thing that sometimes you may not understand. We're talking about feeding any in old capital. Uh, we're talking about any feeding any zero to eighteen year old child. Uh, no, they have to be present. Uh, but we will feed any zero to eighteen year old child. If they are in Rome Mountain and they show up at Stony Creek area, they'll be fed. What we would need to do, you know, in the case if uh, some of these restrictions to what we can actually try to go out to them is uh, to have uh, uh, people contact us because I think, you know, going out and just trying to hit roads and side streets, uh, there's going to have to be some kind of accountability for uh, for these uh, for these meals as, uh, as the government will require. But, uh, you know, we'll look at uh, our different options and look at volunteers or whatever it takes. I've got a couple of principals that said they would, uh, in smaller schools, but they said they would make uh, uh, those deliveries to those kids to their houses. But uh, right now, you know, we've got to get over a couple of hurdles in order to do that. Uh, let me say this uh, in, in closing. In our workshop, uh, we had a conversation with the board last week and the matter of working this week, but our board really stood up and uh, uh, the old saying goes, "Put the money where the mouth is." They uh, appropriated twenty-six thousand dollars for us to buy backpack sprayers. Uh, these are uh, electro uh, magnet. Uh, or when you put the solution in there, if it's it's going to be mixed correctly because you can spray your rooms down instead of hand wiping your rooms. You probably saw, seen some up on the news here recently, where Bristol has bought some. But we bought sixteen. We bought uh, one for each school. We bought one for the bus garage. Because in the discussion it come up, you know, our buses are transported on every morning, every afternoon, and are probably one of the, uh, you know, just as important, if not more so, than uh, trying to, uh, you know, keep these schools and everything wiped down. So rather than wiping them down this spray, using this backpack uh, sprayer with the uh, with the chemical, it will stick. You don't have to go back and wipe it off. So you can go in and do a room in five minutes and move on to the next room. So uh, these will be available at each school for uh, the janitors to, uh, plus the additional cleaning supplies. Our board understood that at this time of year, we start running along with our schools with the cleaning supplies. We didn't, we want to make sure that every school had the proper amount of disinfectants to work with and uh, they put pretty additional monies to uh, buy more uh, cleaning supplies for the schools and to uh, make sure they had uh, chemicals to work with. Sorry, did you have a question, Mr. Blevins? Okay. Yeah. Are those days going to be forgiven or are they going to be made up? On the, from now to the 31st. It's a uh, government has. Governor has declared a, a state of emergency, so uh, you know I can't say really 100% sure what the commissioner. But I think the commissioner has uh, powers, and they have given her the powers and the duties to forgive the, uh, these days. So what we'll have to do is just write a letter, make a request, and um, 
you know, uh, see how long this takes us, but uh, there's a very good chance through the way through that we'll be able to do that. Right now, uh, we're not real sure in uh, Friday's uh, meeting in Greenville with other superintendents, we uh, we had a conference call with uh, with the uh, commissioner, and uh, right now we're still planning on you know moving forward. But uh, once we get into April uh, and see you know what the situation is, it could uh, it could be our our uh, our out through. Uh, or up to that time, so I'm not sure what they're going to do in terms of uh, administering the test. I'll send a lot of teachers and worry about that, actually. Still, uh, well, right now, uh, what they have said, of course, uh, you know, in about a month or, uh, but uh, just plan as if we're still on for the test, but there's lots happening and uh, things are changing daily. So, what we'll do <laughs> over the next uh, two weeks, especially while uh, our people are out of school. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll put additional information on our web page to keep people up to date as to what uh, states come in telling us that uh, they're going to do or, or whatnot. There's a, there's a whole lot of disruptions as it relates to. Now, one of these good news, and I was just talking to Mr. Crane about, uh, it does not look like that this is going to interfere with, uh, with our BEP money in terms of uh, what uh, our estimate will be coming in. And we were told Friday that. Uh, Instead of three estimates this year, we'll get one in April, and then we'll get one in uh, in June. Don't we get three? Yes, sir. Uh, in the uh, in reference to the food prep, uh, will the regular cooks at each school be there working? Yeah. Okay. Will the teachers also be there? No. Well, I'm just wondering, since they're working, drawing a salary, regular salary, and the teachers are not working, they're still going to be drawing the salary also for not working. Well, what uh, you talk about for the ones that's not working? For the, to anyone, any employee, uh, referencing the teachers, yeah. if they're what? not there, they're still going to be paid for yeah. the office. And they're not working. Uh, I'm, this is not a complaint. I'm just wondering how that would be. Fair. Say right for yep. the cooks to have to work to get we, their salary. We have actually, uh, uh, Spenders and I talked about this this morning, and uh, the reason we don't want a bunch of people there is we're trying to keep people out of large groups. So with our staff that's going to be managing each one of these five schools, they're being paid an extra, which would be uh, probably a supplement for doing this based on the fact that they're going in. Uh, outside of uh, everybody else being off. Ms. Feathers and I spoke about that this morning. I think that's a fair thing to do. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, thank you. That's possible. Awesome. If you're that. So. Yep. Thank you. Is it out? Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ward, light up one of you more. I recommend it. Financial Management Committee, uh, Chairman Johnson. Mr. Chair, let our committee uh, reflect where we're being and let first question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Health and Welfare, uh, Dr. A. Cuff. On March, we'll let the uh, minutes reflect what was discussed in the meeting. We did have Dr. David Kirsten come along with Carolyn Kirk last week to our Health and Welfare Committee meeting, which met on Friday. Uh, I think the, uh, Dr. Kirsty was really impressed that uh, we took our Friday nights to, to talk about coronavirus. So we'll talk a whole lot about that tonight, but to rest assured that uh, Abby and, and Stephen have done a lot to make sure that our building is adequately protected. We're using a, a new solution that uh, is, is applied to non-porous uh, floors and walls, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, I think as Abby told me, it's the same solution that the Ballard hospitals are, are utilizing in their facilities as well. And it is um, effective against a number of viruses and also the SARS-related coronavirus, of which we're talking about and which this um, uh, version is a part of. Uh, likewise, every office has wipes in them. Uh, they are also very effective against this virus. And we encourage our employees, particularly 
those that are not only doing desk work, but are also taking uh, things uh, over the counter that they like their uh, stations off uh, regularly and then making, make sure that uh, they're applying and using it correctly. So uh, those items I think are important to us. There's one additional item Commissioner would be brought to my attention and to um, Commissioner Jenkins' attention last week. Uh, the elected officials met and uh, Commissioner Whitley was there and following she sent us a note regarding what are we going to do about employees who contract the disease. Um, we certainly don't want them coming to work uh, so they'll expose others, but we need to come up with a policy and Chairman, I, as I told you in an email, I don't know if we should do that tonight, but we need to start thinking about things. <coughs> Time is upon us as the schools are taking action, as other individuals, uh, organizations are taking action. We need to decide how we are going to apply what needs to be done for our employees. The second suggestion that came uh, in the email from Commissioner Woodby and the discussion out of the elected officials roundtable is that if a uh, county employee tests positive for coronavirus, that they be sent home uh, and they, you know, um, be isolated, stay home for the 14, 15 day period. But it then comes up with one, how do we make sure that they stay home? Because if, if we're not going to pay them, for instance, and that's not what the suggestion is that we're bringing to the floor, but uh, obviously, Many of our employees live paycheck to paycheck. Also, their issues are surrounding if they take annual leave or sick leave uh, and have to go beyond that duration. The suggestion that's coming from the elected officials and, and Commissioner Woodby is to send those folks home if they test positive and let the county absorb uh, the, and continue to pay them. Uh, without them using annual and sick leave. So we'll need to come to some discussion about that. The other issue is how do they get tested? Uh, as the mayor alluded to, I reached out to um, our insurance brokers and they sent me what they had just gotten uh, on Friday uh, evening, which our employees, by going to their primary care physician, can request the test at no charge. So anybody that's on our insurance can do that. So that's the first line of defense for us. The employee shows up and says, tells her supervisor, you know, I had a headache, I might, I might be feverish. You need to send them directly to their primary care doc. In fact, if they, I would hope they would call in if they're uh, having those symptoms that the supervisor would say, you need to go to your primary care doc now and be tested. Uh, if they test positive, then we don't want them coming back to work them to go home and be uh, self-quarantined for a period of time for at least 14 days uh, as the uh, disease runs its course. I think what is before us uh, is one discussion of this particular issue and two, uh, if we want to address it tonight, we would need a, uh, a motion and a second uh, to actually make it apply to our employees. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to open this up to discussion. I, Leave that to you, sir. Mr. Jenkins. I'd like to put that in the form of a motion. I'll say second. second. Commissioner Profit, second. What's the motion? What is the motion? Uh, if I report our employees may uh, test positive for the virus, we're going to pay them um, and not get an offer for sick time. But they do, stipulation to that would be they do have to provide proof that That's they do correct. have a positive test. Yes. It can't be that. Yeah, that would be the same. Yeah, it's positive. Question, Commissioner Garland. Well, I'm not trying to be a bad guy here. I mean, what if they get sick for six months or something like that? Do you have to cover the whole time that they're sick and off work or sick? So, Commissioner Travis Hill. What are we going to do if a child is sick and they, they're the only parent they have to say don't take care of them? We're going to, they're going to follow the same. Well, if the child gets sick, they're most likely going to be sick real short after right. the kids have to come to Right, and, and, as, and Carolyn didn't mention it, but Kirsty mentioned it uh, to Health and Welfare Friday night. Obviously, if you've got an individual that tests positive, that whole household should be quarantined. Yeah, yeah. there's a whole office. Yeah, and that's the, uh, that's the other issue. What if somebody uh, 
uh, and an office gets uh, comes down with the illness, how do, what does that do to the, to the others that are working there or the public that they have met? Those are considerations. Mr. Hale, uh, just one more thing, uh, something that might need to be discussed. I don't know about every office, but now's the time to start getting some people cross trained to fill in for these people when they're gone. Yeah. And so the county doesn't come to a standstill. Mr. Von Cannon. You said that, did you say that you can request a test? But I distinctly heard today that before you can request a test, you have to get proof from your doctor that you need the test. Well, that, that's the role of the primary care physician. Uh, but uh, I would dare say if you present with uh, a cough and fever and respiratory uh, issues, uh, that's you're a good candidate to be tested. Yeah. So, yeah, you still have to have a doctor from a doctor's. Well, and that's why they're, able, they're to we're sending them through their primary care physician to make that decision. If he or she says, "I don't think you got it," then uh, um, th then I would imagine um, I would like to err on caution. I don't know that I want them to come back to work immediately. Uh, because sometimes for individuals, the incubation period is longer than it is for, for some. Uh, I think the CDC says that 97% of the population, if they've been exposed within 11.5 days, they will come down with illness. Some will come down sooner, but the average uh, time is 11.5 in terms of what CDC says to uh, this week. Commissioner Baker. Would you be willing to take that? Amendment to that motion basically, then we'd pick it up after 10 days. I mean, that's two weeks. I mean, just there's a lot of ants in for butts there. And I mean, if you've got sick days, I'm not against no way it happening, but it's like us at school. If we get sick, we've got to use our days before anything like that picks up. So, I mean, just be willing to accept that motion. We'd Mr. James, you made a motion, sir. You want to accept the friendly amendment to the motion? We would limit it to 10 days. I mean, after the 10 days. I mean, I would be open to setting a limit on it that we would pay out for, and then maybe there's sick days pick up after that. I would be able to put a minute on that, but I think that we can set a time period that will capture that period, and if it prolongs past that, then it's something that we just employ sick days or um, <clears throat> any other benefits they have we need to pick on. But I mean, you know, I'm going to be able to, you know, what are they typically for? You mean two weeks? Yeah. Well, 14 days. So, I mean, I, I would be open if somebody wanted to do a friendly amendment, or I would, I, I changed my motion to say that, that we would pay no longer than 14 days, and then they'd have to start using their sick time. Up to 14 days. Commissioner Frey. Let's pause on that for just a second, because, okay. because short-term disability is a thing. So after they've been out for so many days, if they are going to continue to be quarantined, short-term disability would need to pick up. Well, that's 15 days. Yeah. Yeah, for like where I work at, it's after five days. Like if you're out for five consecutive days, you're going to be out for a period. It kicks up after that. You have to burn a week of your time before that kicks up. So, okay, a lot of discussion. Could we come back and state the motion again, uh, Commissioner James? Would you do that for me? As I understand, the motion is that you uh, pay the employee up to 14 days with the county absorbing the cost. Let's let's make it this way. He, Travis says there's a 15, so we'll do 15 days. If they test positive for the coronavirus, so. Uh, who made the second on that motion? I have to. That was a question. Yeah. What is our short term disability, Brad? It's uh, also something many people would have. That's the other side of the world. That's the other side of the world. That's the other side Mr. Prophet, I have a question. Is, uh, the 14 day period, is that set in stone? I mean, is that going to be a standard? Has that been confirmed or is that just an assumption right now? The time period? Uh, that seems to be the course of the disease. Um, it could be longer for some, depending on their frailty or their immune incompetence. So it might vary by individual to individual. I don't think 14 days uh, should be set then because this is not, we're just assuming that the people will be over it in 14 days, whereas it's not a, a fact that they will. It's a, indefinite right now, am I correct? I mean, there's no. That's your, that's your CDC guidelines. Yeah, we're just going by CDC guidelines, and we may have to end up 
looking at it case by case. What some of the clerks in the other state are doing in the clerk's offices are, if they are out, they are taking it, they are, they are letting them stay out as long as they need with pay, but they are recouping that, that pay up to serve so many days off of their vacation day. Maybe if an employee is due to get 10 vacation days, they would owe the county three to four of those, depending on, that is what a lot of the clerks in the state are doing right now, in the clerk's office, the circuit court clerk's office, they're recouping. But of course, somebody's gonna have to keep up with that, I, I, that individual. Um, if they get 15 days, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Travis Hill. Dr. Aiken, are they requiring any of the locals that in the state, are they getting retested at a certain point to see if they cleared the virus or? Uh, I would imagine there will have to be, although that hasn't been stated protocol as of yet, but I think that they should be tested again and show negative. I mean, we, we just watched the drama with the Hoffmans, with Jeannie Hoffman, and she was tested several times. And, and before uh, anyone is let back into the U.S., if they have a fever or not, as you know, everybody's coming back from Europe or wherever, uh, they have to be tested. And, and then self-quarantine, and then those two really should be tested again. To so think of me like Dr. Acuff, since this is so fluid, things could change. Right? It could change tomorrow. So the motion seems to me like it should be based on the information that we have right now. Yeah. Because it could change later. <clears throat> and that's something that I feel that we can address at that time. The current rises. Right. right. And the motion could be paid. Employee, the employees paid up to the 14-day quarantine. And then at that point, they need to submit reevaluation from a doctor at that point if they need to stay out longer and then after that 14 days you would evaluate and per the doctor's note. I mean you can't punish these employees if, if they do contract it. We don't, definitely don't want them coming back in because all my 14 days is up but they can still have it. You're just defeating the whole purpose. You've paid out all this money but they come back into the office and then somebody else is going to end up with it. And, and we, we certainly have to be sensitive because as we know the, the scale pays in this county uh, uh, Pay, pay scales. Um, as we mentioned, there are some people that you know can't miss a check, and so we've got to think, we've got to be what, sensitive. And what, what you will see in these offices, employees who haven't gained in those sick days, they're not going to take their sick days if they do get sick. They feel they need to come to work because they've still got the job right. on that. So that is. So there's no yes, and there's no. They knew there was some form of compensation if they did test positive for it that they wouldn't be um, their sick days used. I think that would help them more likely to go get tested if they did come with the symptoms instead of not get tested and continuing to come to work because they don't want to use their sick days. Commissioner James, excuse me, Captain Smith, would you speak? Would worker comps come into play anywhere on this? Because. We're exposed. I mean, we got people coming in now, especially law enforcement. No, sir. I would say, well, turn. Yeah. The attorney says no as well. Commissioner <clears throat> Gardner, I have a question for the attorney. Is there any legal issue we could get into this where somebody that tested for the flu said, well, I mean, I want to go on too and get paid for it? I mean, it just hypothetically. Could somebody come back and say, well, they, they got there because they got corona, I've got the flu. So, <laughs> I mean, it sounds funny. Right. right. Well, the two things you probably hear me say more than anything else is treat everybody the same. <laughs> anybody can sue anybody for anything. Yeah. Uh, so there's no, there's no magic answer that I can give you. I would just, if you're going to create a policy, adhere to it, treat everybody the same. Um, you know, you don't want to punish people who, who may enjoy good health and be frugal with their days and, and, and make people work who you know, enjoy bad health and, and maybe have been here long enough to have days. Uh, and you want to look out for the safety of everyone as best you can, realizing that there's, you know, somebody's going to abuse it at some point because that's what happens in human nature. So um, as long as you create a consistent policy and follow it uh, and try to do the best you can, uh, that's what I would suggest. And, and I would err on Commissioner Ridley's side on this. Uh, we should certainly want to provide incentives for folks to stay at home. We don't want them coming back back to work. There are a lot of people that come through this courthouse on a daily basis, as all of us know. Uh, some are younger than others, some are older than others, and this particular virus um, travels quickly 
Uh, it, it, it can live on surfaces. It can live on clothes for a while. I mean, I just saw a study from NIH this past week that how long the, the virus stays on the surface. That's why it's important to use something. Uh, if you know, somebody sneezes or whatever, or touches us after they've been to your station, we need to make sure the county employees are wiping that area off so it protects them as well as the next customer. Uh, there are going to be, um, as, as if you've listened, uh, I've been on so many conference calls uh, on um, COVID-19 over the past three or four days, uh, as it was pointed out, the information changes every day, but this is going to be a respiratory issue. Uh, the President made the statement this morning uh, when he held his briefing encouraging the governors, they were all on conference call, encouraging the governors, you need to find uh, respirators and other um, things that you can lay your hands on that you can cut the red tape too quickly because uh, for, you're going to use you, you're going to use those particularly in a certain section of the population. So again, we, we want to err on the side of so many people come through here that we don't need to contaminate them. And we certainly don't want our uh, sick employees coming to work with this particular entity. Do we get into any kind of HIPAA violations by, we don't have a centralized HR when somebody at the department head realizes that their person has COVID-19 and they have to tell payroll that they're going to be out for having that? I mean, obviously those are those could be concerns. I mean, but if we're going to have a policy that requires uh, delivery of a positive test, I mean, it's similar to FMLA and things like that. I mean, we still have to have medical documentation of the condition. Uh, it would obviously be, behoove us to keep that uh, ring of people small who need to know that uh, and not, not broadcast that. Okay, we've had uh, much discussion. Still the same motion, Dr. Uh, Commissioner James. 14 days. I would add 14 days with the option of if they test positive after the 14 day period that they could, we would allow them to use some of the vacation days. Okay. Like the other entities uh, are doing. The problem you run into is them coming back because they do not want to use their vacation or sick time. If you don't, if we don't protect the county employees that are on the front lines right now, we're going to end up with everybody having it. But the jail's could... a concern, the, the emergency responders. Right now, I don't know if anybody's aware, but the Tennessee Supreme Court Justice has come down with an order on the courts. Our judges are not even, a, our judges, we're protecting our judges, but we've got to protect the others that are on the front line. Um, we're not allowing anybody in the courthouse over here. There's no in-face, person-to-person court contact with any of the judges right now. Only your constitutional rights, which is to address bail. Other than that, they're, they're not having any court proceedings. But yes, the county employees are still on the front lines. We have to support them, 100%. And I'm a county employee myself, not just me getting sick, but if one of our county employees' children contacts it, they should be in the same boat. It's the unknown factor. Commissioner Wilby, excuse me, I'm sorry. That's fine. You. Are you willing to lift that 14 days? Is that what you're I mean, the 14 days, it's a number, but it's really an indefinite. We don't know. We, we have to address that employee as if they're updating us as the doctor tells them to before we can allow them back into the office. Mr. Brown staff. I think that that uh, Caroline Hurt and them addressed it pretty well that that's not, that uh, <laughs> that right now everything is still fluid. And so the CDC, the only thing the only information that you can actually go by is what the CDC mm -hmm. is coming kind of Right now we're pushing down a, a 15 day quarantine window. Um, you know, whether they come back in two weeks or five minutes or two months and say that's 28 days, it, it doesn't matter. Right now it's 14 days. If you test, uh, test positive in your positive, which you cover up to those 14 days, if you come back and you are retested, you're still ill, you're retested, you hit another 14 days. Um, yeah, and, right. and, so eventually, and you would, eventually you should test out. Correct. Yeah, hopefully, you right. that. Uh, but if yeah. you're still sick and you're covering it for yes. one full day period, you're going to have to cover it for another full day. We need to remember, too, we can always call a special call meeting to deal with this. If we have to run out in 14 days, we're not going to be here. So, maybe again. So, well, you know, not unless I call a special call meeting. So I mean, we, we need it up to 14 at least. <laughs> okay. That's another 
Commissioner Fraser. Commissioner Bill's not gotten to speak yet, are you? So. Go ahead, Commissioner Bill. Should we not consider cutting back to only absolute necessity services at some point? Or um, taking a cue from the retail stores that are that are shortening their hours of operation. Um, I, I don't. I feel like our folks need to get paid, but I also wonder, you know, what happens when a whole office gets shuttered because no staff? Um, are there are there non-essential services that we could put on furlough for? A period of time. That's what our office has done, and we will go down to a skeleton staff starting Wednesday. Some of our girls are deciding to use their vacation days to stay out of the office. We are only filing essential paperwork, and we have a girl sitting at the six foot back from the door with the bailiff stopping them and asking them why they're here. If it's not essential, they're being turned away. I'm just to not allow them in the building because if it's not essential, it can wait. So then, among the county services, obviously, highway must go on. Obviously, law enforcement must go on, but some of the offices, I mean... Well, we have, we have I think that's a good example. We have some excellent, <laughs> excellent elected officials who use that judgment. I just want to add my input. I don't want to ask the county employees to use sick or vacation time if they're tested for this COVID-19. Whatever we decide is fine, but I'm not asking, I do not want to ask them to do that because People are at low numbers on those items right now, sick and vacation, and it's just going to fire down. Mr. Travis Hill. Can we just make it contingent upon them bringing back a negative test from yeah. the doctor, saying that they can't return to work if they're clear of the virus? Right. Commissioner Fraser. One of the things that I think that we need to understand is, is there's a lot of people that come through this courthouse on a daily basis. And even if there is someone that comes into this courthouse and exposes our employees, not only are they going to be exposed, but all the families that come in following them are going to be exposed as well. It's not just a situation of watching out for the employees, but the employees are at the most at risk because they are going to be in contact with more people. And then the people that come in are going to be obviously in contact with where they have been as well. So it's not just about the employees. There's going to be people coming into the courthouse that probably aren't even really going to care if they're, may not even know that they are exposed and sick. But it is an incentive for the employee to get tested and stay home. It, and there's no way around it. You're going to have an employee that, if they know they're taking care of them, they're going to be taking care of while they're out. If they get the symptoms, they're not going to have. They're not going to go back and forth with themselves saying, "Should I get tested? Should people know?" But they're going to know they're going to get tested, and if they test positive, they're going to be paid to stay home. And they're more likely to do that. Which, which Commissioner McCamey. Well, and you have to look at too, because being a mom, you make it better, and then your kid may get sick yeah. and stay. So then you're. Are you starting over? Like you don't want to come in and have that job? So. Commissioner Von Kennedy. Mr. Uh, Commissioner James is, is on target for a temporary for a temporary situation. However, this this is something that we're we're trying to do tonight. We're not medical experts except two of us. <laughs> Therefore, I say that that we that we go ahead and on a temporary basis vote to use vacation days and table the rest of the situation to get a permanent fix from the health and welfare people. Um, I don't think there's any way in the world, as fluid as this is, if you're watching see the television at least two hours a day. This is fast moving. CDC is putting out guidelines right hourly, aren't they, Dr. Ector? So I think we need to try to do the best we can for our employees to not with that motion. I'm not, I'm, I should have been here. Remember, for uh, you listen to Anthony Fauci, who is at the NIH Infectious Disease, he's been there for a long time, indicating that we need to flatten the exposure of the contagion curve. If we, and that's exactly why Trump closed the borders. That's why you've got, uh, as he said today during the governor's uh, conference, uh, if you've got 10 people in a room, you've got almost too many. So we're, we're violating that victim tonight. At any rate, that's on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
we don't have any cashes yet. We don't think. But, but uh, you know, we need to err on, I think, on the side of our employees. We want to protect them. And uh, certainly, I don't want to see any of them bankrupt their leave, uh, whether it be sick leave or annual leave. Commissioner Michael Perry. Yes, sir. The report came in from Watauga County, North Carolina, that an employee of the Samaritan's Purse organization had returned from a mission trip uh, nine days ago. And their estimate is that this individual, in the nine days that he was asymptomatic, possibly infected as many as 50 people, and they don't know how many more. So because of that human interaction and just, just going about the day-to-day the, the -day grind, this courthouse is an ebb and a flow of people constantly. And so I think we need to look at, at the very least, take a cue from retail and restaurants and offer some curbside delivery wherever possible and limit, limit access to the, the, the offices themselves because, I mean, our employees are going to be subjected to, uh, we, we don't know. We, we don't know where people have been. And, and this is a very public place. So I, I think that would be a, a very prudent step to take to see if we could if we could sequester people in offices and limit as much face to face as possible. I, I don't know if that's even possible, but it, it, it doesn't take much. Um, and our our employees in the offices here, especially in the clerk's office and the 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 assessor's office, all of them. They're public-facing roles. They, they don't know who's coming in from, from day to day. Mr. Jenkins? I, I don't know where we're at. We're so many, so many, different, so many ideas. Mr. Right Mr. Cavazell? I just want to say I think we're doing the right thing by being proactive. I think we need to set the tone for the region. So I'm going to offer an amendment to, to Austin's. To, we set it until they bring back a negative test. Yeah. Correct. Them Correct. Back. Contingent upon a negative test. Here, here. The Commissioner Johnson? Uh, make sure. My question is, we're planning everything for reporting. How much money we got? Where's it coming from? Mm -hmm. So do we have? If we're looking at the senior already on history that's taken place, they're forecasting like fifty percent hit. Is that right? Uh, the latest figure said as as many as seventy percent. I said okay. I'll, we got 268 point on county school, and if you did that to 100, 130, 130 on the average salary, we have to pay off two weeks. Real quickly, that's a great sum of money. Do we have that in the car? Wait, 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 wait. The, the, the money's already made. The end of the salary. The budget. It's already lost. Yeah, the money's already appropriated. The salary. What's happening is their paycheck would just keep coming. Yeah, it's like they're not double dipping, they're just the paycheck continues to roll in. Yeah, their budget is yeah. already, salary already appropriated in all the folders, but it's just Mr. Brown, that's all. Okay, this morning I'm 92. Mr. Brown has the floor. Okay, this morning I'm 92 9. I was listening to it, and they said that one person in an average day could, if they was infected, could, could take and, and give 248 people this virus and out of that 248 people you could look for two to die now we're talking our employees here and we're talking serious stuff do you put a money value on our employees i mean this is something we need to look at serious also I mean, the children of the employees that's too. exactly right commissioner miller all right you started this discussion a long time ago at 14 days, is that right? Then you added the six days with that. Is that correct? Yes. All right. You're, you're talking about that person, that patient, getting better within that 14 days what if they don't okay this could go a long term because if they uh, depending on how bad the case of COVID-19 they had 
which could go for a long period of time because it sets up pneumonia, you end up in the hospital, you know, and this just isn't 14 days that you might be talking about. So, it, in order to stay within some kind of budgetary limit, you're going to have to set an amount of days, and then that would be it. I mean, it, it comes to a point where you can't, and, and, and you're just, we're just talking about one. What if it's one of the other commissioners said, what if it infects five or ten or twenty or on and on? You know, you, you're committing a lot of money, not just for 14 days if you take this on and on and on. I mean, this... We're not spending any dollars. I think the best we can do is the motion. Well said, Commissioner Member. Commissioner uh, uh, James's motion is about the best I think we can do with the information we have before us. Go ahead, sir. And I'm agreeing with Nancy. I, I think it's hard to put a, a dollar figure on the pool. I mean, it's, it's, it's very well possible. But I would like to add a note that I do understand is that the money is already factored in. But let's not forget the money's factored in based upon estimates. And as the traffic goes out, your sales tax revenue goes down. Your all your other revenues that come in go down. So your monthly collection that you anticipate is not going to be as much as what we get. So that is, I mean, it's it's an issue that we got to address. Where is the money coming from, regardless whether it's factored inside or line items? We operate on what the revenues we collect every month. We init, we estimate it. So you know we've got to. So I think we accordingly. Yes, sir. I think we have thoroughly discussed this issue. <laughs> Motion state it one more time because there's been so many variants. 14 days, is that what I'm hearing? The motion is to... I will go with the motion and I'll, I'll, I'll change my motion that we... Uh, I'll shut that right. That we will, with the first, that we will pay 14 days with a positive test and if they retest and test positive again, we will pay an additional 14 days. After that point in time, I feel they need to use their vacation or sick time. Okay, we're here second on the motion. Second, Commissioner Fraser. Any more discussion? Chairman, Chairman. Go ahead. May I say something at this point? Just food for thought. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Trustee's office during that time said that you, as far as protecting us and working daily, yes, it's not as bad in our office that people would come, lean over, pay their money, mm -hmm. and say, <coughs> Excuse me. I just came from the doctor and I have a flu, but I wanted to pay my taxes. How do we know that somebody is not going to breathe on us that has this virus? And I was just told by a doctor, try it. Seriously, honestly. They told me that you didn't have to have someone sneeze or cough or touch, that if you sat beside them, you could catch it because it was so highly contagious. And I wish that could be considered when making decisions about the employees. That's all I wanted to say. Just food for thought. Thank you. Sorry, Brad, I cut you off. When we say 14 days, is that 14 work days? Just two 14 calendar days? Are we going to pay for 10 work days out of 14? Yeah, we'll pay for 14 work days. Work days. I could go with 14 work days. That gives them more than a month's time to see if anything have to have that it would include the spouse and the children of the employee if they are as much as I hate to do it I'm going to reject because I, I, I feel that's the point in time that they have to start using their sick days because there's got to be a point in time that we cut it off. I mean, what do you do if they got cousins that live in the houses or they got, you know, at some point in time we've got to say the county can't support no more. I mean, I think we're doing what we've got to do right by our employees, but I don't know where you, I mean, I just don't know. you got to draw a line, in my opinion. We have a motion and a second. 
Medical or Colorado? No, just one more and more comment, and I, I've certainly uh, Mr. Sports comment here. Yeah. Um, you know, other facilities uh, have gone to taking temperatures and asking people certain questions before they were admitted to the building. That might be something that we want to consider. That uh, temperature is taken if they're feverish, you know, they can't come in and expose everybody who's in the courthouse. Um, maybe that uh, chairman takes another motion, but and we would have to figure out how we're going to do that. Who would be in charge of that? Since we don't have a single point of entry yet, there's a whole lot of factors. I hate to cloud it, but I do want to protect our employees. I think that was well well studied. So, sorry, sir. No, you're good. Okay. Uh, at what point do we come to the conclusion that we need to close the doors, and we may have to? I mean, to protect our what? Where do we stand on that tonight? I think it would be great to have some publication on the website <laughs> the mayor's office. These uh, the uh, department heads at least post that. Only, I mean, necessary transactions. That, I mean, if you have to, a lot of the stuff can be paid online. I mean, a lot of these fees. Now they charge additional fees. That's a problem. Well, I mean, okay. Well, well, okay. Well, 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 $23 <laughs> transaction. I mean, we have a motion. We have a second on this particular motion. Then we'll come back to Dr. Akaf. Madam Clerk, call the roll. Collins, we use the same vendor the school system ha uses. Those items are currently on back order right now. We have looked into purchasing them and they have no idea when they're going to be back in stock. Well, I mean, we're just setting aside money for that purchase. If we can't purchase it or we don't use it, then it'll go back. But do we want to let a whole month to come back around and get prices to figure it out? 
Commissioner Grindstaff. My note is just that we have a building and grounds budget. We have a, a mayor budget too. That the monies are you know, should still be in there to be able to purchase. If they need more monies, then that's fine. However, I would recommend asking if they have enough monies to, to make the purchase before we just set aside those money. Currently, I think we have about $3,800 to $4,000 left in custodial supplies that to do with the rest of the fiscal year. That will get you two of the supplies at the big convention school. But that means there's no more toilet paper or paper towels or soap or hand sanitizer. Paper anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, King Tyler. So, uh, Commissioner Campbell. Is uh, there anything out there that you can talk to the governor about, about to get this set up on the chemicals and the like on CLG and the brand of emergency there? Well, I can't model it. I'm sure there's something else there. There's supposed to be money. Because they're going to kill you as fast as we are. There's supposed to be money coming with this. Okay, I thought I'd get that. Is that correct? Okay, yes, there's supposed to be money coming back, and this is the other reason why uh, Trump declared a national emergency, and so that we can change the rules so people can spend money. I don't think we need to set aside $10,000 or the anchor. A little bit over $1,400 and say here to watch the school system. I'll just a little over $1,400 at least. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Is available, and so I mean, if we could actually 
go on the board and get the chemical here, I'm sure, I can't speak to the school and the school board, but I'm sure they would probably let you all know, <coughs> Mr. Spurber, because like I said, we've got 16 coming. Well, let's just so, stand back, Mr. Spurber, so we didn't say you take it close there. Mr. Jenkins. Well, those two weeks they'll be doing deep cleaning with it. Please respect us. Let me get deep cleaning in a few minutes. On that note, we just said the school's closing. Are they going to be deep? Ours will not be here for six to eight weeks. Ours is on the order. That's what I'm trying to say. So when they come in, you get, they're getting four gallons of chemicals with each one. It makes us an ounce to the order. Commissioner James. Uh, I don't know if it's possible or not, but I could uh, just talk about um, there's a lot of facilities I've been getting emails all day long about different facilities shutting the doors and different facilities doing this. I know we're not able to block people from using exits, but are we able to lock the doors from entry and we'll go ahead and place a single entry? Um, well, as long as you're not entering. You, you can't enter through, but you can exit through. Can we go to Penn State or County Attorney? Uh, again, the only concern I would have with that would be the fire marshal. I, I think we can restrict to one entry. We're going to do it. That's the plan. My concern would be uh, sitting at the door testing people who's qualified to do <coughs> that and restrict. I mean, this is a, a public building. It's a little bit different than a, than a hospital. And while I'm talking, I guess, and y'all kind of mentioned this a little bit, the county commission doesn't have the authority to shut the courthouse down or the offices. Uh, the only people who could do it is the, the county health officer, the mayor, uh, can do it with the declare the county a state of emergency. Uh, and the individual office holders have the right to control their own offices and set their own hours. And that's up to them. Uh, they only answer to the voters and whether or not they're you know, derelict in their duties. Uh, and I don't think this would qualify if they decided they were going to close, but it's not a commission. Mr. Mayor, question on the chemicals. You may have to have certified, somebody certified to disperse the chemicals. Not with, not with the ones that the school system is using or that we can get through our supplier. It's not a chemical that you have to be certified to use. <laughs> That's why West Virginia doesn't have any cases. All the same pits. Maybe this question Miss Gooch can answer. The, the fee that they charge to, to renew your tags, the additional fee, is that something that can be waived? Is there an additional fee for doing it like online? We can. I mean, that might limit some people coming to the courthouse if we waive that fee. I know the city is waiving fees on water payments. I believe that's what they got to work right now. The electric's already waived all online and open phone fees. You're talking about the online fee, the whatever yeah. else. Those are charged by the credit card. Company. That's the companies. That's their fee they collect for providing the service. Yeah. We don't pay for the service. They collect that fee and that's the I'm sorry, that is a credit card. Yeah, the BIS, yeah. That's their fee they collect for providing the service. We don't pay a fee for them. Mr. Cameron. I'm sorry. 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 I'm I would say so. I would say so. Yes, sir. It's coming to the county. Yeah. <laughs> Could be reimbursed. Reimbursed, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else on health and welfare at this point, sir? Uh, no, just a date to put on your calendar. Uh, we had talked about uh, having Burt Rosen from the Knoxville Air Rescue Ministries come to talk about homelessness and what their 60 years of serving Knoxville done for them. He has, uh, we have uh, put on our calendar the 30th of April, so hopefully we'll be past a lot of this, um, at the uh, Carter County Health Department, and we'll invite the community and other nonprofit groups to be a part of that. It'll start at 3, so we can get some of our school teachers and school personnel involved in, in talking about the homelessness because of that. 
comes with a whole bunch of other issues that would be important to talk about it, and we'll uh, reserve it until 7 p.m. on that date. Uh, I don't think it will be that long, uh, but it's an opportunity for us to visit with her and see what they've done in Knoxville and maybe ask the community what we can do about this issue that we have in Carter County. Thank you. Highway Committee, uh, Commissioner Blevins, Chairman Blevins. Oh, some point uh, but there's there's nothing on the horizon and in relation to that I'd like to thank everyone for approving the resolution recognizing the uh, the importance of hunting um, with that resolution our intention uh, I had that drafted was to align the county policy with the state amendment to the Tennessee Constitution providing for the citizens right to hunt fish and trap uh, as well as the Federal Pact Act. With that, I hope we can clear some space by giving these folks some assurances that, that whatever is enacted will not interfere with their enjoyment of the sport and their ability to continue with their agricultural enterprises, subject to reasonable regulations, which includes the normal rabies vaccinations and uh, uh, adequate food and water and such. Um, I am looking into some kind of option for a low-cost rabies 
vaccination program that maybe would be a nice accessory piece to bring in this back so that uh, that, that wouldn't be such a, a financial burden. But um, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Nominating the committee, Madam Chair, uh, the Okay, I'll make this real quick. We met and um, we made a recommendation that Mark Dotson fill the Industrial Development Board position. Uh, and I'll need to get a motion for the recommendation. Motion made by Commissioner James, second with Commissioner Chester. Any discussion? First or the sixteenth. The early board's meeting on the thirty-first. Thirty-first is here. Oh, okay. So, so the thirtieth of this month is a possibility. The ninth of April or the sixteenth of April. Those are our three choices. It should take us, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half tops. Or that, yeah. It would most of the time be set up. I'd almost bet that we're not going to get 20 more four people to agree on that day. <laughs> what? <laughs> and won't you just tell us a day? Yeah, I'll be happy to. I appreciate that. No, go ahead, Chairman. Go ahead. 
we spent 30 minutes talking about COVID-19 right here. They don't want more than 50 people to agree. We're trying to set up a time. Everybody get together in 30 minutes. Chair, can I crack up? Commissioner Jenkins, can we not do it in small groups? We could. We could set up multiple days. I guess. I think we. I think we need to. Oh, I can. Sure, we can do. That's a good idea. We can just do it with each uh, committee meeting, which is still more than ten people at a time. I saw an email today from one of those county agencies, whatever we get that from, that they're trying to start. I guess want us to do uh, teleconferencing or things like that. I think that's one way that that's we, a, we need to consider that that's a for our meetings. Mr. Chair, uh, if you looked at the education of folks around, you know, Kelly sent me a whole list of, of uh, freebies. I guess we could go and call them. At College of Medicine, we're using a program called Zoom. And I, I, I understand it's you, very user friendly. You can get a lot of people online. It's unlimited. Um, you can. Are, there's a lot of functions in Chrome already that you can use to do stuff like that. So I don't think it's something that we would need to pay out for, like Zoom or go to a webinar or uh, anything like that. So that's a real possibility for future meetings, for the commission meetings. But we're acting to meet somehow first and get everybody set up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then, I mean, I'm fine if you all want to meet during the meeting. We set aside a couple of days and we'll come in an hour at a time. Okay. Well, yeah. Are you doing it? I'm doing it. It's Anthony Lawrence and myself. So we can get together, come up with some dates, and then send out an email to everybody and let you all sign up for a time slot. Have like five at a time, and once a time slot gets taken. Thank you, sir. County Attorney Report. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if you've done it, really, you know. I'm going to show you how to do it right here, right here, every time. I'm going to do it right here, right here. Uh, for the most part, I'll be trying to read the report as always, but I do want to talk about the length of tax sales. I know I talk about that quite often, but we just did that this past Friday, uh, and it is a massive undertaking. It, it takes a year. I just finished it, and I'll file the next one in two weeks, and we'll start over again. But, uh, there were 44 parcels sold on that day, a total of $472,832 was brought in. We don't get to keep all that. $64,242.25 was the amount of taxes due to the county that was collected that day. But keep in mind, it's a year-long process, and when we started, there was over $172,000 owed to the county for 2017 taxes. And we collected that and more in penalties plus 18 to 19. So it's a huge undertaking. It takes all year, every year, but it brings in all the money that we're supposed to be bringing in and people pay their taxes on time. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, other than that, the uh, report will be made. Oh, yeah, and thanks to Melissa more than her staff. It's, like I said, it's a huge undertaking, and she even gets assistance from other counties who help us on the sale day. And without that, we wouldn't be able to get it all done. So thank you to her and her office. And uh, other than that, my report will be in minutes. Okay, before we get to the commission comments, I forgot to congratulate Commissioner Mark Tester on his election. It's good to have you back with us, sir. Commissioner comments. Commissioner James. Just since we're talking about all this COVID-19, when, when are we going to address the fact of all of us conjoining in a room here together like we're, they recommend we're not doing it? What are we going to do with that? Any, any ideas on how we... What are we going to do for the next month? Maybe some of you Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm going to be communicating with the mayor, with, uh, and the mayor's communicating with Nashville. I'm communicating with Josh Harden on a day-to-day -day basis. And as we get close to next month's meeting, if we see that that cannot happen, <coughs> the meeting will be canceled. And... Uh, I think that's, that we have the authority to do that. So, we have a month. We don't, Dr. Aiko can speak to this much quicker and much better than I can. It's so fluid. I, you know, 
I was asked to cancel the meeting today, to be honest with you. And I, I didn't get it. I took a chance. I hope and pray everything went okay. To answer your question, this is going to have to be, I think, a week by week by week. Dr. Ray Custer, y'all can that process. I was just going to ask the county attorney, what's the statute say about how many times the commission is required to meet? Four times. Four times. Mr. Johnson, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Uh, was there a midget that measured these days? Dwarf. Excuse me, now. You all made that fun. I have been a green guy. I mean, you look at it. I'm the skinniest in here now. There's a lot of broad rear ends, but I mean, they ain't no room. I thought the mayor had never gone around that stage. I mean, did something about that. I've got my distance. Other commissioner comments. I was going to go with the same thing a little bit differently. Oh, yeah. We're at some time a little too vulnerable, but. Well, I'm really wrong, but I'm going to get a little close here. Is there any way we can order three more tables? Can you pinch down a little bit and put another table in? Could we do that, Mayor? Uh, order about three more tables. Uh, same size, Mayor, a little bit. Well, I, I just tried to let the bomb a little bit. <laughs> 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 I feel the love. <laughs> we really, we really need four, I think. Okay, another commissioner comment. The board. Commissioner Bunkham. Two quick points. One is, Mr. James is right. Okay. The day they the day they shut down the uh, most of the uh, food waiting rooms today. Uh, therefore, I guarantee you the tax collections are going to be low. We've forgotten one group of people in this business of the coronavirus. The taxpayers of this county, they're the ones that don't have any insurance, they're the ones that are more vulnerable, and yet we're forgetting about them. We've got to remember who pays the bills. We should have, we should have, Mr. Chairman, you should have had that discussion last month because we knew in February, we knew in mid January this was coming. Therefore, tonight we wasted a lot of time with a bunch of amateurs like myself trying to decide what to do with something that should have already been brought to us in committee. I was not happy. Excuse me, Mr. Von Cannon. Excuse me. I agree with some of what you said, but I don't think there's a bunch of amateurs in this room. All of us are trying very hard to do what the people put us in the positions to do include you. I know that you're very passionate about this. I think everyone in here would like to be able to say, close the courthouse down tomorrow because of Miss Ford's concern. I'd like to do that, but unfortunately, the hospitals can do that. We can, we, we can find a way for our department heads to use their good judgment, their elected officials, the sheriff, Ms. Goods, and the rest of them, and the department heads can make their decisions, and we will certainly hear the next time we get together what their decisions have been. Keep the services going. Ms. Ford, I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Any other commissioner comments? I move that we adjourn. Second. Second. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor, aye. Aye.